And so again, the cartoonists strike it. And here it says, uh, the elephant in the room, the 17-year cooling trend. Okay, and here's a scientist saying, why is everybody snickering? Global warming science. Well, they kind of try to come up with all kinds of excuses about what's wrong. Oh, it's in the deep ocean and all the rest of the nonsense that, that they've gone on with. The problem is their computer models are wrong. They don't work. Uh, every prediction they've made using these computer models has been wrong. And I mean everyone, every single one. And this is, the, this is part of the difficulty. This is how the computer models are created. They divide the world up into grids. And the, the smallest grids are like this one is three, three degrees latitude by three degrees longitude. That's a large area. But here's the problem. 85% of the world, we have no weather stations. 70% of the oceans, virtually no weather stations. 20% of the land is mountains. 19% is desert. No weather stations. Most of the weather stations are concentrated in eastern North America and western Europe. And so, to, what are they building these models on? And the answer is, they create a model for each grid, and they guess at what the temperature might be in that grid. Because this is the point they've reached, because they haven't got the data. They create a computer model that tells them, oh, here's the data. They take that then as real data and put it into another computer model, when it isn't real data. That's how corrupted this has become. And, and so you can see. And by the way, you think we haven't got any data on the surface. When you get above the surface, we've got even less. We've got even less. We know virtually nothing about what's going on in, in the, the atmosphere from the surface up. The inability of forecast. Well, here's those graphs of temperature and the change from warming to climate change. This is the surface temperature. This is the satellite leveling off. This is their forecasts. But you see, in 19, after 1990, their forecasts were so wrong, they changed the name again. They stopped saying we're doing predictions, we're doing, we're doing projections. <laughs> All right? And so they came up with, they brought a low projection, a best projection, and a high projection. Even the low projections are wrong. And would you, would you buy anything from anybody that was wrong with every previous forecast they've told you? But that's what they expect you to do. At some point, you say, sorry, you've been wrong. I'm, I'm not listening to you anymore. And, and so you can see uh, the problems that, that have developed. I, I, I got to brag about the Canadian models, the worst of all of them, by the way. <laughs> and Canada has been very deeply involved in this, unfortunately, through the government from the start. And this is the, this is the multi-model predictions from all from 23 countries. Here's the actual temperature. The Canadian model, as I said, was worse than any of them. Its, its projections were the worst. And that's not surprising, because see, one of the things that everybody knows, if you can't forecast the weather two, three, four days from now, how can you possibly tell me what it's going to be like 40 and 50 years from now? You can't. Right? And I like, I like to tell the farmers that. Phone Environment Canada and say, what's it going to be like a year from now? And say, oh, we don't do long-term forecasts. And then phone them the next day and say, what's going to be like 50 years from now? Warmer? <laughs> I've got to disconnect here. Time to disconnect here. This is a, a, and this is the amazing part. By the way, if you, you know, what, I know what's going on in the US, the VA and all of that stuff. Mary McCarthy said several years ago that bureaucracy is the rule of nobody. It is the modern form of despotism. And I think you see that playing out everywhere. The bureaucrats are, have become completely unaccountable. And they, of course, then have enormous power to come in and do whatever they want with you. This, but here just shows you the arrogance of power that they have. Because the, the Canadian government, Environment Canada, they, they give a three months, six months, 12 month forecast. And then they publish how often that forecast has been accurate in the last 30 years. Well, if I tell you that this is a map, it's a 12-month accuracy forecast. The gray is less than 40% accuracy. In other words, you could be better with tossing a coin. And the dark blue, less than 45%. The average accuracy for all of Canada is 41.5%. 
Would you buy anything from somebody like that? But what's amazing is they publish this on their own website. They say, look how bad we are. Oh, but keep sending the chat. <laughs> it is, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. And I, I'll show you, um, this is again the Canadian. This was their <coughs> forecast for the winter of 2013, Eastern Canada, above normal. <laughs> They couldn't have been more wrong if they tried, <laughs> right? And, but then when you look at the accuracy of, of their forecasts over that three-month forecast, it's 48%, less the chance. And, and you know what? If you say tomorrow's going to be the same as today, you've got a 63% chance of being right. <laughs> and the governments achieve about 70%. Boy, you're paying a lot of money for that extra 7%, I'll tell you. <laughs> it is really quite amazing. And just to make you feel a little better, your own NOAA does the same thing. They do their monthly or three months, six month forecast, and then they do a, a test. They test the, to, to determine how accurate their forecasts are. Um, you can see that you're, you're at 57%, so pretty good, right? <laughs> Way better. I mean, 57% accuracy is just incredible. And when you go and look at what it costs you, what those agencies cost you. It's phenomenal. I want to show you this quote. This is from a person who was in, he's a me me meteorologist and physicist. His name's uh, uh, Klaus Eckhart Kloos. And this is what he said about a year ago. Ten years ago, I simply parroted what the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, told us. One day, I started checking the facts and data. First, I started with a sense of doubt. But then I became outraged when I discovered that much of what the IPCC and the media were telling us was sheer nonsense, was not even supported by any scientific facts and measurements. To this day, I still feel shame that as a scientist, I made presentations of their science without first checking it. Scientifically, it is sheer absurdity to think you can get a nice climate by turning a CO2 adjustment knob. That is a phenomenal statement for a scientist to make. That is absolutely outstanding, uh, uh, amazing, because it contradicts everything that you're being told totally contradicts everything you're being told. <coughs> but what are they exploiting? They're exploiting your lack of knowledge, and I've already shown you some things that most of you weren't aware of. And of course, the old sky is falling, chicken little uh, syndrome. And one of the things they tell you is, oh, there's, there's going to be more severe weather. We're having more severe weather. And of course, they want to do that because they, and they want to, uh, to play on the perception people have. Because it seems like every time you turn on the TV, oh, here's another severe weather event. And Governor Brown with his drought in California and all the rest of it. But let me tell you how this works. If you're introduced to somebody for the first time, it seems like after that, every time you turn around, there they are. They were always there. But they were just not part of your world or your perception. So what's happening now is the media have decided that weather events, and notice why even Fox News, the hyperbole, what are they going to do when they run out of hyperbolic words? I mean, they don't have just a weather report. It's extreme weather. It's extreme weather. Right? And shaking. That, by the way, that's why I think they work. They get you shaking so hard, all the money flies out of your pockets, and they go around <laughs> picking it up. So you think, oh, I've, I've watched so many severe weather events got to be true. But here's a plot of tropical storms and hurricanes from 1971 to the present. Show me the increase. Do you know the year with, when most people died from tornadoes in the US? 1905. 250 people died in 1905. And there weren't that many people living in Tornado Alley at that time. I could make a cruel joke about not many trailer parks either, but I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so you, you, you can see this, and um, here's another example of how they exploit it. This is the U.S. tornadoes from 1950 to 2007. You say, well, there it is. Oh, yeah, tornadoes increasing. But let's look at the facts. Population growth has resulted in more t tornadoes being reported. 
You know that, that Environment Canada is not allowed to say that there was a tornado unless somebody saw it? <laughs> right? Got to see it to report it. So you got more people there, we're going to see more tornadoes. Advances in weather radar, particularly the deployment of about 100 Doppler radars across the US in the mid-90s has resulted in a much higher tornado detection rate. The increase. So suddenly when you start to look at and explain this data, you see that that increase probably doesn't exist at all. And tornado damage surveys have grown more sophisticated over the years. Do you know who made one of the most honest statements recently, believe it or not, was Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett's very heavily invested in insurance. And he said, I've been looking at our records and we've got no increase in claims for quite some time. And what's significant about that? Who would benefit more by saying, oh, it's terrible, you buy more insurance than the guy that owns the insurance company, okay? It's the same way as Warren Buffett pushing the railway and opposed to the Keystone Pipeline because he owns the railway lines across northern U.S., all right? And so you, you start to look, what, what is that? Some, somebody very wisely said, follow the money, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, yes, yeah, so something like that. And here, here you've got, this is the U.S. annual count of, of strong to violent tornadoes, 1954 through 2012. There's no increase, simply no increase. And, and uh, so you, you start to see uh, what's going on. But this is one of the most interesting ones for you to understand, because what are they telling you? Oh, the Arctic ice is melting, the polar bears are dying, and all oh, this, whoa, scare, scare, scare. And, and uh, this is, uh, again, looking down on the North Pole. This is for April of 2013, and it shows approximately 15 million square kilometers of ice is, is the red. And then this is the same diagram by September of that year, and there's the Arctic ice by September. That every single year, approximately 10 million square kilometers or 3.9 million square miles of ice melt every year. In other words, an area the size of the continental US. That is normal, normal. But how many people are aware of this? The answer is virtually nobody, and that's why they chose these things, because they, they know you don't know. And let's put that in some perspective. That means that it melts in approximately 150 days. So 3.9 million square miles melting in 150 days, that's 25,900 square miles a day. That's normal. I'd love to see a headline in USA Today that says, an area equal to West Virginia melted today because that's what happens. That's normal. But let me show you how they play the game. A few years ago, they said, oh, more ice melted in the Arctic this year than last year. An area the size of Texas. Oh, that, so big, Texas. Oh, my, I, my favorite joke, by the way, the Texan talking to the New Hampshire farmer, and the New Hampshire farmer said, how big is your farm? And the Texan said, oh, it takes me about two and a half days to drive around in my pickup. And the New Hampshire farmer thought for a minute and said, I got a pickup like that too. <laughs> but of course, you see, when you say, well, what's the area of Texas as a function of, of the continental US? It's about 4%. So it's not significant at all. But the use of the term and the idea of people's minds, then it becomes a harem scarum thing. Uh, just for interest's sake, this is the ice conditions two days ago on May the 7th. You see the ice starting to retreat, uh, starting to melt in Hudson Bay, and of course the polar bears are all down here um, waiting, or, or coming ashore, I should say. They come ashore uh, around the Hudson Bay where they have their denning and the, the young are born. This picture on the left, because you see you hear about the polar bears drowning, and this was a photograph that Al Gore used in his movie. The woman who took this picture was on a tourist ship in the Arctic. And she said the polar bears weren't threatened, they weren't drowning, nothing. In fact, they climbed up on this ice to see what was on the ship. And they saw food. <laughs> they are superb swimmers. In the search and rescue we did in the Arctic, I've seen polar bears 100 miles offshore. Why do they swim so well? Because their long fur is hollow. 
And it's hollow because it transmits sunlight down into the body to keep the body warm. Because it's hollow, of course, it floats. Next time you see a polar bear in the water, you'll see all that fur up. And of course, it just paddles away happily looking for food. But one of the things about the polar bear is it only appeared in the Arctic about 100,000 years ago. In biologic terms, that's yesterday. It is actually a modified version of the Alaska brown bear. And because it so recently arrived in the Arctic and modified to a white fur, you find hybrid polar bears, polar bear grizzly hybrids. And of course, the Alaska brown bear lives on land. Polar bears live on land very well, thank you very much. That's how they survived that warm period I showed you when the ice was melting. So all of this nonsense about polar bears. But what happened? Canada, we call the Eskimos Inuit. That's what they wanted to be called. The Inuit have always insisted the bear's demise was greatly exaggerated by scientists doing projections based on flyover count. But their input was usually dismissed as the ramblings of self-interested hunters. How did that come about? Well, the US government said, no, you can't hunt polar bears in Canada. How they got away with that, I don't know. <laughs> but I can tell you the Inuit people were entitled to hunt one polar bear a year, provided the polar bear expert at, at um, Iglulik, by the name of Mitch Taylor, if he said the polar bear numbers were adequate, they were allowed to hunt one polar bear per family per year. But very few of them did it. Mo what most of them did was they sold that hunting license. And they could get anywhere from eighty dollars to $120,000 for that hunting license. And when you're living in the Arctic, that's a lot of money. That's a big income. Gone. Deprived. Completely gone. And Mitch Taylor, the Inuit government biologist, observed in a front page story of the Nutsiat News, the Inuit were right. There aren't just a few more bears, there are a hell of a lot more bears. So all of that nonsense about the polar bears disappearing is just that. And so, uh, and by the way, Canada had a polar bear conference two years ago. They told the Inuit leaders and Mitch Taylor, don't show up. They, they banned them from coming. 